Good morning. How you guys doing today? Y'all survived the new year? Yeah, yeah, all right, we did. That's good. I love this time of year because um, it is one of the few times a year that I actually um, pause and reflect. I am not a kind of pause and reflect kind of person. I would, if you hang out with me at all, you know I would much rather be getting dirty doing something or, or you know, have my hands in something. Uh, I'm more of an action type guy, so reflection for me is one of those spiritual disciplines that I don't, I don't exercise very often. And, but this time of year, for whatever reason, you know, as Sean was talking about a minute ago, it's a great time of year to do that, and I find that I do that more um, at the, the turn of a new year. This year, though, uh, was kind of interesting for me because, because uh, my, my birthday is New Year's Eve, so you guys didn't realize it, but you celebrate my birthday every year, uh, which I really appreciate, uh, but, but this year I turned 49, and so like, uh, I, in fact, I just got contacts. I, I made fun of my wife for so long because she had to wear the little reader glasses, and I haven't had to do that, and I was making fun of her for getting old. And now I've got contacts. I can't even see you guys out there. I mean, you know, I, I know you're there because I hear you laugh. I can still hear. But I, I, if I fall off the stage, would you guys help me back up? I'm just saying. But I turned 49 years old, and I, I started realizing, holy cow, this year I'm going to be 50 years old. I don't feel that old sometimes, uh, but I'm going to be 50 years old this year. And, and it really kind of caused me to take a step back and go, man, 50 years old, you know, probably, most likely, more than half of my life is over. And, and, you know, unless I live to be 100, which who knows, but, but more than half of my life is over. And, and I really started thinking about, okay, what, what does God want to do with the next part of my life? If, if half of my life is over, what does the next half of that life look like? And I really started contemplating it. And I, I got this sense that, that God wants to do more with the latter part of my life than he has in the first part of my life. And I would consider that some of the things God has done in my, the first part of my life have been significant. To be able to be a part of this ministry and to help start this church and to see it come to the place that it is today, that's been very exciting. That's been a, a, a major part of my life and a very significant part of what I believe would be building the kingdom of God. And so I, I feel that's significant. But when I, when I started looking back over, over the last, uh, the first part of my life, I realized this year actually is very significant milestones for me. As I said, I'm, I'm turning 50 at the end of the year. This summer, I will have celebrated, my wife and I will celebrate 30 years of marriage together. Yeah, that's right. I don't know how she puts up with me. All these years, she has, she's like Mother Teresa, I believe. <laughs> it's true. Um, this this uh, year, uh, I will celebrate 28 years in full-time ministry. Um, I've been saved. I've been saved this coming November, 30 years. So my wife and I got married in July. We got saved in November of that same year. Um, and 22 of, the, of my years in full-time ministry have been with Sean and Lori uh, building uh, what we're a part of here. And uh, that's been a long, long, adventurous journey together uh, as God has worked in our lives. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think about those things. And as I think about those things, I, I began to realize something that what God wants to do with my future, what God wants... My, the second part of my life to be about is directly connected to what he's already done in my life. God doesn't just walk away from the things he's done in our past and say, okay, that was neat. Now go do something different. God uses those things in our lives to build for our future. And so as I, I started contemplating that, I realized there's a passage in the scripture that really illustrates what I sense God doing and saying in my life, and it's, in, it's found in Joshua chapter 3. Now, leading up to this, just to kind of give you the backstory, if you're not familiar with it, um, prior to this, the, you know, the Israelites had been in slavery in Egypt, and they began to cry out to God, and 
God sent Moses. Moses uh, led them out of Egypt. You know the story. Uh, Pharaoh followed them and they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and, and Pharaoh's army was drowned. And then they uh, went to the, uh, the Jordan River and Moses sent spies in to scope out the land and the report came back that there were giants in the land, all except for Joshua and Caleb. Everyone else said that there were giants in the land. And so the people elected not to go into the promised land, the land that God had promised to Abraham hundreds of years earlier. So then they spent the next 40 years wandering around in the desert. Moses uh, and the present generation, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, the present generation passed away. And um, now Joshua is in leadership, and Joshua takes them back to the river. And he says, okay, God is telling them, now it's time to go into the promised land. So that's where they are. They're getting ready to walk into what will be their destiny. The, the promise that had been given to Abraham, they're now getting to fulfill. And in Joshua chapter 3, starting at verse 9, this is where we'll pick up with the story. And it says, Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words, the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, uh, Perizzites, the Gegershites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. That's very significant. We'll talk about that in a moment. And as the priest, as soon as the priest who are carrying the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. And so he tells them, this is what's going to happen. And then, if you read on in the story, Joshua, uh, the Lord tells him to pick 12 men, and, and as soon as the, the ark steps in the river, the, 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 the priest carrying the ark steps in the river, it says that the river will be cut off, and that's exactly what's happened. And now, God didn't choose to do this in the summertime when, it was, when there was a great drought. He did this, he did this at flood stage. The river's at flood stage, you know, and that's the way God is. Whenever God's going to do something in your life, he always pushes it, like, to the point where you believe it can't go any farther, and then he pushes a little bit farther, and that's when he moves. Okay, and that's exactly what God did for the Israelites. During flood stage, he cuts the water off, and it backs up. It says it backs up and, and, and floods towns upriver. And then they walk across, and then God tells Joshua to take these 12 men that you've selected and have them go right where the ark is and pick rocks out of the river, and then take them out, and carry them to the place you stay that night. And so that's exactly what they did. And then in Joshua chapter 4, verse 20, it says this, And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that he had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground, for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. What a great moment in their history. God, and God was very specific in how he did this. He didn't want them to just cross the river and go, that was cool, and move on. And, and there was a reason for this. He wanted them to remember what he did. He wanted them to memorialize what he did because they had been wandering around in the desert for 40 years and you have to know that's in the back of their minds. You have to know they heard the stories about the first time that they came to the river and how they got afraid and they chose not to go in and take possession of the land. And God wanted them to remember this. He wanted them to understand that He was doing something very significant in their presence. And it would be a point of remembrance for them. 
so that when they got to the other side and when they began to go and take possession of the land, that they would remember what God had done for them. You see, because remembering helps us realize that the future is possible. If you're taking notes, write this down. Memorials remind us of God's faithfulness in the past. And it gives us courage for the future. It reminds us of what God has done in our past. Because we can go back to those points in our life and we can remember, God did this for me. God did that for me. God worked this out for me. And we can go back to those moments and remember those moments, contemplate those moments, And that helps us understand and remember that God is a part of our life. He's working actively in our lives. And therefore, we can have faith, we can have courage, we can have hope for the future things. The things maybe that we're facing right now, the things that are in front of us. We can have hope for those things. Because we understand what God has done in our past. And that's what memorials do. And for the Israelites, memorials at at this particular time represented rocks. Because you, can you imagine if they had just left the rocks in the river and God never told them to do that and they came back to the river? They would never see those rocks that came out of the middle of the river. They would have just seen the water. But God had them take those rocks out and bring them and, and pile them up so that every time they came back, they would remember what he did. They could tangibly see that. And for us, memorials may look all kinds of different ways. It may be a moment that is crystallized in our mind and our hearts where we can remember exactly what we were wearing, where we were, what happened, what we felt. All of those experiences that go up and, you know, that are wrapped up into uh, a powerful experience in our lives, you remember all the details. And God imprints that. He, He marks your life with that. And you never forget it as long as you live. And that becomes a memorial to you. Maybe it's something tangible that you did. You know, for us, every time we walk on this campus, and it's real easy not to see it, but that big giant amphitheater sitting right there is a testament to God's provision and power for this fellowship. Who would have ever thought? But He did it. And every time we look at that, every time we look at that hill, every time we look out over the campus, we go, look what God did. That's what memorials are, and, and, and for each of us, they may look different. And for many of us, we've got lots of spiritual memorials in our lives because we've been following Christ for a long time. For me, this year will be 30 years of following Christ. And so over that 30-year period of time, I've had a number of, of uh, periods of my life where God did something very sp- significant and powerful in my life, like getting saved, like meeting my wife, like uh, being called in a ministry, all of those different times, being brought to San Antonio, being connected with the Azaros, all of these things in my life represent memorials for me where I can go back to that moment and go, I remember when that happened. I remember what God was saying. I remember what He was doing in my life. For some of us, though, maybe you're here today for the first time. Maybe you haven't been in church ever in your life. Maybe you decided, you know, after the first of the new year, you know, you You didn't decide to work out. You decided to go to church. And you're here for the first time, maybe in a long time or maybe ever. If that's you, I want to welcome you. And I'm excited, but maybe today is the beginning of that spiritual journey for you where you will have a memorial. You can look back on this day in 2015, in years to come, and say, I remember, I remember what God did in my life that day. He changed my life, and that becomes a memorial to you. I have a sense that that God wants to take these memorials in our lives, and He wants to build on them for our future. And if our memorials remind us of what God has done and gives us hope and courage for the future, then what can we learn from them that will help us on that journey as we as we contemplate 2015 as we consider what God wants to do with our future what can we learn from the things that God has already done in our lives to help us be prepared for what he wants to do in the future let's take a look the first point that I want to bring up is this our memorials serve 
as a point of no return. They serve as a point of no return. In Joshua chapter 3, 9 and 10, we read these passages just a moment ago. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and He will certainly drive out before you. And then he lists all these nations that are in the promised land. See, Joshua, God wanted these people to understand when you cross that river, I'm doing something very significant. And I want you to take those stones and I want you to pile them up so that when you get to the other side and you start becoming afraid because of the nations that are in front of you, you look back and you can see that pile of rocks. And you can remember that my, my destiny is to take possession of this land. And they needed to know that. If you know their history, if you've studied their history at all, you know these guys were whiners and runners. Okay? They didn't spend 40 years in the desert for no reason. They didn't spend 40 years in the desert because they really liked the desert. They spent 40 years in the desert because they were afraid to trust God and believe that he would do what he said he would do by driving the nations out. So because of their lack of faith, they walked around in the desert for 40 years. But if you go back farther than that, they were crying in Egypt because they were in slavery. So what did God do? God sent Moses. God sent Moses. Moses led the people out. They get to the Red Sea. They look back. They see the army, uh, the Egyptian army coming after them, and they know that the Egyptians are going to kill them. And so they start crying. God, you, you brought us out here to die. We're just going to die in the desert. That's terrible. That's exactly what they did. And then, so God parts the Red Sea. They walk across on dry land. They turn around and look back, and the whole Egyptian army is drowned in the sea. And you know what they do? They start complaining because there's no water in the desert. They just saw this crazy, miraculous miracle, and the first thing they do is start crying because they're out in the middle of the desert and they're going to die of thirst. So God provides water. And then they start crying because there's no food. So God provides manna, this bread-like substance that showed up every morning. And then they started crying because they didn't have any meat. So God provides quail, so much quail that they literally get sick of eating the quail because they were gorging themselves on the meat and they, they started throwing up. I mean, it's crazy. That's the kind of people that they're dealing with. But we laugh about that, but how often do we do the same thing? How often do we do the same thing? And God knew that what these guys needed on the other side of that river was to get to a place where they could not turn around and go back anymore because they would see the stones and know that God did something miraculous for them. Therefore, they must move forward. They must move ahead. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to have points of new re no return. And let me tell you how a memorial becomes a point of no return. It's when it becomes public. See, if God says something to you, if he challenges you or speaks something into your life and he wants you to act on it out of obedience to him and you keep it in your head, well, you can justify that God really didn't say that, can't you? But as soon as you share it with someone else, now you're accountable for it. You're accountable for it. There's been a number of times in my life where I have sensed God saying something to me that I didn't want to be accountable for. A lot of times. One in particular, a um, long time ago in this ministry, when we started out, we were doing inner city ministry. And I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing. And I sensed God saying to me, I want you to move your family to Victoria Courts and live with the people that you're ministering with. Now, you have to know this. My wife and I at that point had been married 10 years. So that was 20 years ago. 10 years. And we had just, for the first time in our marriage, bought our first house. First time in our marriage, bought our first house after 10 years of renting. And now God's telling me he wants me to move into the inner city. Leave my house and move into the inner city. And I'll just tell you, for two weeks, I didn't say a word to anybody. In fact, for two weeks, I argued with God. God, this can't be real. This can't be rational. This can't be responsible, you know, I mean, I tried to use all the R's. I, I, 
I, I did everything I could to get myself out of this situation, but every time I did, the feeling just did, would not go away, and it was like God was, God was just silent. He's like, no, nah, I ain't got no more to say about this. I already told you what I wanted you to do. And so I finally got the courage after two weeks to tell my wife, and it was kind of like, you know, it was kind of this sheepish type of deal because, I, you know, we just bought our first house. And the, here's the thing. The reason she wanted to buy a house, not that she needed some possession, because my wife is not that way, but she said, I, I want a place that's mine, that I don't have to ask a landlord if I can do something. If I want to decorate a room or paint a room, I don't have to ask anybody. I can just do it. And now I'm telling her, we're going to move out of this. And I went to her, and I swear this is what she said to me. I went to her, and I told her what I felt God saying, and she goes, well, you know I'm not very attached to this house. And I, I'm like, you're crazier than me, okay? I just want you to know that. You're crazier than You don't make any sense. You and God, neither one of y'all make sense. And I was blown away, but that was such a confirmation for me that God was already working in her heart. And we did for one year. We moved into a ministry center that we bought, the, the, the ministry bought down in, right across the street from Victoria Courts and lived there for one year. And then we were able to move back into our home. Um, but when you share those things that God is doing in your life with other people, when you take those stones from underneath the water and bring them to the surface, they become points of no return. They become memorials that are public for everyone to see. And every time you turn back to go the other direction, you have to run right into that memorial. And so I challenge you, what, and I ask you, what, what memorial or what thing is God saying to you or has been saying to you, maybe you've been wrestling with for years and you've kept it private, you've kept it public, I mean, you've kept it uh, hidden inside, no one else knows about it, and you keep wrestling with the same thing. It's like you're wandering around in the desert. You've never crossed over the river and made it public. So... What prevents you from making that public? What prevents you from sharing that with someone and letting the world know so that you can make that a point of no return in your life and therefore allow God to work on your behalf in a way that He hasn't been able to because you've kept it suppressed? The second thing I think we can learn from our memorials is this. Our memorials remind us that He is Lord of all. They remind us that God is bigger than everything else we see in front of us. In Joshua 3, 11 through 13, Joshua says, See the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth. I love that phrase, the Lord of all the earth. will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes, one from each tribe. And then he says, And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, it's its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. I love that he says, the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. What he's saying to them is, God is bigger than the giants on the other side of the river. God is bigger than the mountain that you fear. God is, excuse me, God is bigger than that thing you're wrestling with. God is bigger than everything else in front of you. And our memorials remind us of God working in our lives in the past to give us the faith and courage to face those things that we're wrestling with right now. Some of you may have come in here with something that is extremely burdensome to you. Maybe it's a relational uh, issue that you're having. Maybe, maybe it's a sickness that you're wrestling with. I, I don't know what burdens you carry, what mountains are in front of you. But I challenge you to stop and look back and see how God has worked in your life in the past and build confidence on that, that He is still actively involved, even though right now it may feel like you're all alone. Because that's what happens when you're in the valley. You feel all alone. You feel isolated. And the memorials remind us that God is never abandoning us. He's always with us. And it reminds us that God has worked in our life back here when, when we needed Him to work in our lives there, 
And if he did it there, he'll also do it here. I love the story of David and Goliath. David was a young man, uh, maybe a teenager, older teenager, not exactly sure his age. But he had a bunch of brothers, and his brothers were uh, out fighting with King Saul and the Israelites against the Philistines. And so his dad told David, and David was a shepherd. That's what he did. He took care of sheep. He told, he told uh, David, he said, I want you to take some, some food out to your brothers out at the front line. So he gets out there, and there's this big valley. And on one side of the valley are the Israelites. On the other side of the valley are the Philistines. And every day they would line up facing each other. This is like a weird way to have battles. I don't know. But they would line up and face each other. And then the Philistines would send this guy out named Goliath that the Scripture says was a giant. He was huge, ungodly large, okay? And and they would send him out, and he would start mocking the Israelites. And the Israelites, because of Goliath's size and his reputation, literally trembled with fear. And every time Goliath would come out, they would turn and run the other direction. Well, David gets out there on the day that he shows up, and it's no different. They line up on this side. They line up on this side. David is there. Goliath comes out, and he starts yelling curses at, at God's army. And David be- gets very offended by this. And he says, how dare he do that? Is somebody going to do something? And everybody's like, we're afraid. We're afraid. We don't want to have anything to do with that. So David starts asking around, well, why didn't somebody do something? And word got back to the king that there's this young man in the camp who's talking about going and fighting Goliath. And so they bring David before King Saul. And this is the conversation. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 34 through 37, Now, you just have to know this first. Saul told David, he says, David, you can't go out and fight Goliath because he has been trained in battle his whole life. He is a proven warrior, and he's a giant, and you're nothing but a boy. And this is David's response. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. I love that. So I've been trained, highly trained at shepherding, okay? I've got my staff. I'm not afraid to use it if I need to. I mean, you know, that's kind of, I'm sure that's what Saul was thinking. Plus the fact that he's just this young guy. In fact, they said they put his armor on him and it it literally consumed David, okay? He says, I've been keeping my father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it and I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, and I struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defiled the armies of a living God. I love his faith. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hands of this Philistine. I love that. I love that. Now, is David's faith in himself and in his skill? Or in God? It's in God, right? God rescued me from the lion. God rescued me from the bear. See, what David was saying was, remember, I want to share with you, this is what God did in my life. He rescued me. He gave me the ability to deal with this situation. He brought me through it to the other side. And because of my experiences in the past, I have courage that even though your whole army won't go out and fight this guy, I'll go do it. I don't need any help because God's with me. See, that's what memorials remind us of God is Lord of all and that's the faith that David was walking on he he had this understanding that God is bigger than whatever is in front of me it doesn't matter what it is he's bigger than that and I can trust that he'll get me through what memorials do you need to go back and visit what memorials do you need to go back and allow God to show you how he worked in that situation, how he moved in that situation so that you can have faith for the future, so that you can have courage and hope for the future. That's what they do for us. And lastly, our memorials can encourage others to find faith in God. They can encourage others to find faith in God. You have no idea how your memorials how your moments, your spiritual moments with God can influence someone else's life. 
And Joshua says in Joshua uh, chapter 4, verse 21, he said to the Israelites in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Why is this pile of rocks laying on the ground next to the river? Tell them, the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord, your God, dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord did to the Jordan what he did, what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. See, what he's saying is every time you tell this story, it's going to influence people. Every time you share this story of God's faithfulness in your life for generations. In fact, thousands of years later, we're telling this story today. It's still inspiring people. It's still encouraging people. We have no idea what our story might do in someone else's life, how it might inspire someone else to take a step that they, they've been wrestling with for years, but you share something God's done in your life, and it doesn't have to be God parted the sea in front of me. It could be as simple as, let me tell you about the path I was walking and how God came in and forgave me of my sins and changed my life. And I'm a different person because of that. And that in itself might change the course of history for generations. If that person responds to it. And you have no idea what God's going to do in your life. Or through your life. By sharing your stories with someone else. God set me free. God opened this door for me. God miraculously provided financially when we were struggling God provided a new job for me. And on and on and on those stories can go. But as you reflect on what God has done in your past and you share those with other people, they're going to be inspired, I promise you. They're going to have faith that they didn't have because of your story. 27 years ago this past summer, I was 21 years old, I believe, at the time. I'd only been saved for less than two years. And I was sensing that God wanted me to be somehow more involved in ministry. And we were, I was doing construction at the time uh, with my grandfather and our, our family business. And we were attending this small church, and very small church. And they had a group of students, and, and the pastor was taking these students to a conference in Dallas in Texas Stadium. And, and I remember uh, him inviting me to go along, and I was, I was thrilled to go. I mean, I'm... I don't know anything. I'm just brand new in my faith journey. I know very little scripture. I'm reading the Bible. I'm learning as much as I can. But, but I get invited to go along, and I was so thrilled to be a part of that. I'll never forget where I was sitting in Texas Stadium and the moment that God did something very significant in my life. This guy came up, which I didn't know, had never heard of him before, didn't know anything about him. His name was David Ring. In fact, you can go online and you can find videos of his story if you want to listen to his story. This guy has cerebral palsy, and he uh, has a very difficult time. He has to walk with uh, uh, metal rods, you know, almost like crutches that are on his hands uh, to walk. And then when he talks, it takes every ounce of focus that you have to try to understand what he is saying. He, he labors in his speech trying to get his words out. And he began to share his story and the challenges and struggles that he's had through his journey. And the end of his talk sharing his story, which I thought was fascinating, he made this statement, and God struck me at the core of my heart. He said, if God can take me with my struggles my struggle to talk, my struggle to walk, my struggle to do anything. And if God can use me, what's your problem? And at that moment in my life, there was no question God was calling me into full-time ministry. I knew that beyond a shadow of a doubt. 
And he used this guy, David, who David doesn't know what God did through his life in my life. He has no idea. I never have never met him. I only saw him from a long distance away in a big room looking at a big screen. But God used his story to change my life forever. I would have been in construction probably for the rest of my life. But God used his story to change my future. And so what stories do you have that might inspire someone else to go beyond where they are, that might challenge them to take steps of faith, that might change their course of history forever, their future forever. So as we think about 2015, as we think about the opportunities that are in front of us, I want to challenge you. Go back and consider the things God has done in your life. And And because of the things he's done in your life, what does he want to do with your future? And you might be here today, like I said earlier, maybe this is your first time at church or maybe you've been coming for a little while, but you you really honestly could say, I don't know that I have a spiritual journey yet. Well, I just want to let you know, today you can do that. You can invite Christ to come into your heart just like I did almost 28 years ago this November. You can invite Christ to come in your heart just like I did and forgive you of your sins and change the course of your life. Today you can do that. And today could be that memorial for you where your spiritual journey begins. And you can look back and say, that's where it all started right there. So in just a moment, I want to give you an opportunity. I want to lead us in a prayer. And I want to give you an opportunity, if that's you, just to invite Christ to come into your heart. For the rest of us who've been on this journey... What does God want to do with your past? How does He want to use your past to influence your future? How does God want to take where you are right now and give you vision for what He wants to do with the rest of your life? Don't settle for mediocrity. Let God go beyond mediocrity in your life. But it all begins with what He has done in your life already. So take some time, reflect Remember what he's done and let him use that to inspire your future. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we each can look in our lives and go, you're working in our lives. And even for those who are here today and, and maybe haven't begun that spiritual journey yet, they're here for a reason. That's because you're working in their lives. I just pray for those people that are in this room who have never had an opportunity to invite you into their hearts. I ask you, Father, that you would just open their hearts to what you're doing in their lives. And if that's you in the room, I just ask you to pray this prayer to God, not to me, but to God after me in your own hearts. Lord Jesus, I realize I've got sin in my life, and that sin separates me from you. I also understand that you died on a cross to save me from my sins. And I invite you to come into my heart. I invite you to forgive me of my sin. And I invite you to change my life. I pray that you would give me a new future, one with you. Help me to grow and become like you want me to be. Thank you, Father. Lord, for the rest of us, I just pray that you would provide space for us to pause and consider the miraculous things you've done in our lives and help us to use those as stepping stones for our future, to remember the miraculous work, to give us faith for future works. I pray that our our memorials would inspire others to take steps of faith in their own journey. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who needs to take a a, a stone that's been hiding in our lives and make it public so that we can be accountable for it, I pray that you would give us the faith to do so. We just invite you, Father, to challenge us. We invite you, Father, to work in our lives in a new way. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, if you, just, if you just prayed that prayer to invite Christ in your life, would you do me a favor? Take that connection card that's in your bulletin and fill it out and just check the box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ. And I want you to do one of two things with it. 
which you can either drop it in the offering boxes on your way out and someone will contact you this week and give you, we've got some materials we'd like to give you to help you on the journey. Or you can right now go and speak with someone at the uh, uh, information center and they've got the material there and you can go pick it up before you leave today and begin that journey. We just want to help you on this journey. Let today be the day that your life was changed. Lord bless you guys. Have a great week, Mike.